Hi, I'm Ben Mildenhall, and I'll be presenting this work on behalf of my collaborators. There's been a lot of recent progress in computer vision and graphics using simple, fully connected networks, also known as MLPs, to represent 3D objects or scenes. For example, an MLP could take in a low-dimensional input, like a 3D coordinate, and output a binary value that indicates whether or not that point lies inside or outside the 3D object. This is fundamentally a continuous representation, and it can be densely sampled to recover the encoded shape. In contrast to typical uses of deep networks to represent high-dimensional functions, here we are trying to get the MLP to represent a complicated function but on a low-dimensional domain. One simpler example of this is using an MLP to represent an image, taking in the 2D pixel coordinate as input and outputting an RGB color. Here's what happens over the course of training an MLP to represent this signal. As you can see, the network struggles to learn high-frequency details like the fur on this box. We present a simple technique to fix this problem. Instead of just inputting the low-dimensional coordinates directly into the network, we first pass them through a Fourier feature mapping, which looks like a set of randomly scaled and rotated sinusoids. This allows us to control the frequencies that these MLPs can represent in practice. With this technique, the MLP can quickly learn the high frequency details in this image. We can understand why this Fourier feature mapping helps us train coordinate-based MLPs by looking at the recently proposed connection between training deep networks and kernel regression methods. Before diving in, we'll briefly review how kernel regression works. Kernel regression is a method for non-parametric function estimation that takes in a set of input-output data points and estimates a continuous function fitted to those values. This estimated function is always a linear combination of these base kernel function elements, one centered around each input data x value, uh, and these typically resemble a Gaussian bell curve or some other blob-like shape. Adding them all up together produces the continuous estimated function. And these weight values w are set such that your function passes as closely as possible to all the input points in a least square sense. As you might guess, it's really critical to pick the right kernel function. If your kernel is too wide, then you won't be able to represent high frequencies, and if it's too skinny, you'll end up overfitting to the input data. Here's a simple visualization of that effect when fitting a 1D function to these yellow data points shown on the right. The blue line shows the kernel regression estimate given this input data using the kernel shown on the left. Uh, here we've added a red marker so you can easily compare the width of the kernel with the x-axis distance between yellow training points. Right now the kernel is too wide, so the function estimate is too smooth. If we vary the width of the kernel function, then we can go between this smooth low frequency underfit function and an overfit function that doesn't interpolate well between the input data points. This gives you an idea of how important the kernel shape is. Going back to the connection with neural networks, uh, there's been this explosion of ML theory work recently that's produced incredible results that precisely characterize the behavior of networks during training under certain limit conditions. And the basic takeaway is that training a sufficiently wide network performs kernel regression with a known kernel. When we use Fourier features to modify the input coordinates, it actually changes the width of that kernel to make it much better suited for the tasks that we want to do. And the exact form of this Fourier feature mapping is simple. You just sample a random matrix B that is very tall, uh, basically a long list of random projections of the input coordinates. Then you pass those projections through sine and cosine functions. All you have to do is sample the B matrix once and then fix it during training. It's just a deterministic mapping, not another network layer. And this general mapping is exactly the same uh, as the random Fourier features proposed by Rahimi and Recht in their seminal paper. Just to give some intuition, I want to show a basic example in 2D. Here we're going to sample each row of the random B matrix from a Gaussian distribution. We'll start by plotting the input coordinates for a regular grid sampling of 2D points. So increasing the value of x1 from 0 to 1 results in a ramp from left to right, and similarly increasing the value of x2 results in a ramp from top to bottom. After passing these coordinates through the Fourier feature mapping, we get these sine waves at different frequencies that are tilted due to the linear combination of the x1 and x2 dimensions. 
Remember that the way that we'll process these is by stacking them in the channel dimension and processing each pixel separately with a fully connected network. Now we can justify theoretically why this allows us to learn higher frequency functions using neural tangent kernel theory. For a standard fully connected MLP, the corresponding neural tangent kernel can be expressed as a scalar function of the inner product of any two input points. And it turns out that a 4A feature mapping has a really nice complementary property, where the dot product of two feature vectors is actually a stationary function of the two original coordinate points x and y, meaning that it's shift invariant. If we move x and y by the same amount, their feature space dot product actually stays the same since it only depends on their difference. If we combine these two facts, we can see that the Fourier feature mapping also makes the NTK into stationary kernel, and it gives us a direct way to manipulate the width of that kernel just by changing the scale of V. This is really the big punchline here. Changing this single scalar has a huge effect on how well the network is able to learn different frequency components of the training signal. So if we change the standard deviation of our random B matrix, we can actually traverse this performance trade-off. Here on the left, we're showing an image encoded in a coordinate-based MLP supervised on every other pixel value. In the middle, we're showing a trade-off curve of PSNR versus 4A feature scale, so here higher is better. And on the right, we have a central slice of the 2D kernel function to emphasize that smaller scales give you wide kernels and large scales give you skinny kernels. With too small of a scale factor, the network struggles to learn high frequencies and we get an oversmoothed output. And with too high of a scale parameter, the network overfits and exhibits bad high frequency aliasing. We find that for this task and many others, a simple linear search can suffice to find the best scale value. And just to remind you again, all of this variation in behavior is created from changing a single scalar parameter before training the network. So that's an interesting example, but you might be wondering, why did we use a Gaussian distribution for the random B matrix? What happens if we try different distributions? And we found this quite surprising, but it didn't seem that the distribution mattered much. Here's a plot showing performance on that same 2D image regression task, but for four different possible distributions of B's entries. You can see that each color dot traces out the same underlying performance curve when you plot test PSNR versus the standard deviation of B. And this really reinforces the take home message that all you need to do in practice is pick the right scale for B and you'll get close to optimal performance with any distribution you choose. Uh, this technique is applicable for training coordinate based MLPs and is an alternative to low dimensional arrays uh, for representing a variety of low dimensional visual signals. In all cases, we find that using our 4A feature mapping significantly increases the details represented by the MLP. In this first example, we're training an MLP to regress the continuous 3D occupancy function of this dragon mesh, and 4A features enable the network to represent fine details like the dragon scales. In the second example, we train an MLP to represent the 3D volume density inside a human brain. Instead of supervising with the ground truth 3D measurements, this network is indirectly supervised in the Fourier domain with MRI measurements. In the final example, we train an MLP to represent a neural radiance field, which consists of volume density and view-dependent color from observed images by using the loss of rendering the observed images as an indirect form of supervision. In all of these tasks, we find that 4A features allows the network to represent much higher frequency details than a naive approach. Thanks for listening, and please see our paper and website for more examples and code.